from a car that cares about you to a minority report screen and a 3D printed chocolate man. The future looks delicious. It was all on show at this year's Intel Future Showcase and we headed down to the event for a veritable feast of demos. In the future, cars may be not necessarily necessary for every single person in life. Um, here in London, I notice that there's lots of cars, but not necessarily all of them are, I mean, not everybody has a car. So um, what if you had a car like Jenna's, who happens to want to share her car for a particular cost, but um, you want to be able to authenticate to this car and then have the ability to borrow the car and know where to put it back and all these other aspects. So by agreeing to these terms and conditions, we're actually authenticating with this car and telling the car, you know, A, this is really us, we have permission, we're part of the program, and we have money transferred, etc. whatever the factors are there. So we're going to authenticate. Now what this does is it's going to synchronize these devices together, this car and, and our phone. We're going to have to buckle up, start our engine. And so first of all, we know where we are and it knows already um, the speed limit that's in this area. Okay, right, yeah. okay so that's pretty much not, not available today normally. No. However, um, the more interesting thing is when we come up to a red light and it would know how long that red light is going to stay red. Wouldn't that be kind of nice when you pull up yeah. to a red light to know? that it's going to be red for six, oh, wow. five, okay. four. So it would allow us to, again, communicate with these infrastructure devices. These are what we call Internet of Things type of devices. Yeah. They would already know. By the way, my doctor's email might come in. Oh, look at that. So the doctor's email, and it knows it's important to me, but notice it didn't display it. Yeah. It just notified me. And it cares about me so much that once there is a proper time, like when the stop is ahead, it will display it at that point. So we come up toward the stoplight up here, and when it turns red, and when we stop, we notice that that is the safe time for it to actually display our email. Now this kind of email might kind of put us into a, a state of kind of higher emotions, let's say. Want to load, let your lab results are in, and call for an appointment when necessary. Well, so it kind of sounds bad, yeah. which means that my emotions might be a little bit more, um, a little higher. And, uh, and so the car of the future might react to that and say, I, from a real sense perspective, like we saw in the other demonstration, might, might change the driving behavior of the car in order to kind of account for that. So it might not allow me to go above the speed limit. It might tighten up the controls of the, of the steering wheel. It might not be as responsive on the throttle. And so again, it kind of cares about you enough to yeah. say, you know, I understand what this said, and I care about you. I'm not going to let you keep, you know, driving erratically. Now, in, in the U.S., we have school buses, and these school buses can cause delays. And so, in this case, it gives you a couple of options to either reroute or to go straight through. We're going to go ahead and go straight through once our countdown yeah. timer finishes. Many people don't like to be stuck behind school buses. No. Start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. And so this gives you kind of one quick option. It's also from, to avoid um, those kind of inefficiencies that might be handy and helpful. So while we're sitting here, a few seconds there, we notice we're listening to our James Blake music. Um, these are our preferences, my preferences. As soon as we get through here, uh, you'll see some of that change. So we're going to zoom right up here to where the school bus is. And of course we'll stop and so our our information panel and our heads-up display are displaying the stop signal. Again, this is coming from the infrastructure, not necessarily from our car. But it understands that the school bus is there and it understands that we're not allowed to go. It's kind of like an impromptu stop sign. Okay, so um, I have a daughter, her name is Steph, and she's calling in. Okay, so, because it's so noisy in here, it's hard to hear, but she just said, Hi, it's me. I'm finished with my practice and I'm starving. Can you come pick me up? So the car has already notified her where's a good meeting point, where uh, it's already started looking for um, great places to eat that she know, that they knows about. All these are coming from the preferences that the car knows about in advance, again. So we're going to go ahead and pull here. It looks like we've got our spot where it's, it's waiting for us to stop. And as soon as she gets in, then... Um, Okay, so there she is, and she and now her, she's going to synchronize her device with here. Now her call list and her music 
yeah. and her preferences, and she has the ability to kind of scan through her own map, not distract the driver. Yeah. But what that does is, she says, oh, I want to go to the creamery and eat. So she's going to share that with the driver, not distracting me. I'm going to say, okay, I'll reroute there, and we'll go ahead and go to the creamery. Now, the car is intelligent enough to understand we're going to the creamery. This is Jenna's car, and Jenna needs her car back fairly soon. So we're going to go ahead and put the car back where Jenna needs it, but as long as it's convenient for both of you. So it's already searching out where the good parking spots are in advance. Okay, so it's found two parking spots. One's metered and paid, and one's free. It knows that I'm kind of a cheapskate, so I'll choose the free spot. So we'll get to here, and as you can see, the creamery is not exactly immediately close to the parking, but it's close enough where we can both kind of agree on this, and Jenna will be pleased that her car is where she needs it, yet I can, don't have to drive so far. And so at this point, we put the car into kind of an auto park situation, and uh, that kind of concludes the, the uh, demonstration. You've seen yeah. that this is really about um, you know, customization, personalization, and, uh, and safety, and um, there are many aspects of that. And this is one, one instantiation, one example of what we vision, envision could be in the future. What we've got here is we're showing the possibilities of when you combine a 3D display with 3D input. The 3D input is the RealSense camera, and the 3D display is actually a special piece of glass which is projecting the screen contents up into the air. So I can see right in front of me this globe, and I can manipulate it with my fingers because the real sense is tracking my hand. Here, you can see I've got a sun, and when I move the sun, it casts the light over the Earth. And just to show the th three dimensions aspect of it, I can put it behind the Earth, which is pretty cool. Um, this is a kind of virtual kiosk. Um, here's a nice way of consuming content. You could flip through a, a floor plan or a catalog in a shop, um, maybe browse some photos. Um, this part of the, the demo shows that we've got multiple fingers being tracked. The different fingertips have got different colors. And you can see it's, it's pretty accurate. It's, it's right on the fingertips. Um, there's a, a nice demonstration here which also shows uh, how versatile the, the software is and how accurate it is on the finger tracking. The idea with this game is that you get rid of the tiles by pushing them, so one at a time. You can see, and it's, for the user standing in front of it, it, it really is like there's a hologram here, and then the hand tracking is just making us feel like we can manipulate that actual hologram, so it's Minority Report-esque. Underneath we've got a screen, and then this, this is a special layer of glass, it's very custom. And what it does is it only lets light through at one particular angle. So all of the light that's coming up to it gets basically mirrored up into the air right here in front of us. So when you're standing in front, it looks like it's floating in the air. We thought, okay, if it looks like it's floating in the air, so it's really a 3D image, then we can manipulate that image by using the 3D input. And so we combined that. This is running on the computer inside, real sense technology, and that knows where the hands are in relation to the image that's projecting. Perhaps one of the more surprising uses of a 3D depth camera is the, the fact that you can scan objects. Because it's seeing in 3D and because it can sense distance at quite a high resolution, you're able to capture all the intricate details of an object. So here, we've taken the Intel Bunny Man and we've scanned it by rotating it in front of the RealSense 3D camera, like this. It's a fairly quick process, takes under a minute. And then you end up with an object like this. This object is captured in full 3D, very easy to edit, and what we did here is we put an Intel logo on the front and we just made the edges a bit harder around the mask. But the, the structure of the, the object is pretty much intact. And then as you can see here on my left, you can then print that out in 3D. So here's a sandstone print, 3D printed from this object model. Here we, we put a loop in the top and turned it into a key ring. This is actually printed stainless steel. This is a consumer grade uh, plastic print. Something you could do at home on a relatively cheap 3D printer. Uh, this one's interesting. We did it quite small because it takes a while, but it's bronze. A nice little bronze bunny man that's 3D printed. And some other materials. You've got a glitter-based metal and some velvety kind of hollow plastics, and here's one of me. <laughs> so, like, did the, so this is, the, this is the camera that you use to take? This is the Intel RealSense 
a 3D camera. Yeah. Okay. And you can see here, it's actually integrated into the top of the laptop. Ah, right, it's, okay. It's very thin. It's actually the thinnest, as far as we're aware, it's the thinnest in the world. And we designed it specifically to be put inside computers, laptop lids, all-in-ones, and other devices. So that's what's used to scan the object and then it saves it in here and then you... Yeah, that's right. It scans at a depth resolution of about VGA. So it's, it's relatively high resolution in terms of depth capture. And that enables you to get really quite a good quality scan. So the metal ones, so what 3D printer? Because I've never seen metal 3D printers. Specialist, yeah. And in fact, you can even print in chocolate. So there's lots of different materials. You can print from nearly anything these days. The question is, can you do it as a consumer? To do something high quality like this, it's actually a professional quality printer. It's going to be quite large. It's got lots of uh, different colors in it and quite good definition. So that's going to be much more expensive. But something like this is significantly less than a thousand pounds today. And it's enabling the maker community to do all kinds of really cool stuff, prototyping and building things. Yeah, because when I had mine done, it was just like a room full of cameras. It's very expensive, it's very specialist, it takes quite a while to process that kind of setup. The convenience is that you don't have to move, but using this camera you have to rotate the object in front of it, but very inexpensive and very quick. So this is just a quick look at what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, the RealSense camera here is taking all kinds of depth information and then what we try and do with the SDK is make that information available to developers so that they can add RealSense capabilities to their applications very easily or relatively easily. On the right hand side here, what you're seeing is the hand tracking. So we've got 22 joints worth of data, which is all the joints in the hand. And as you move your hand and grasp things and rotate your hand and move your fingers and bend your fingers and thumb, and it tracks where your hand is and you can really just use that information to navigate in 3D space or to, to use gesture implementations in your applications, for example. So that's pretty cool. And then on the left-hand side, what we're seeing is what we call um, 3D face tracking technology. And this takes 78 points from your face. And as I, you can see, if I move my eyebrows, it tracks. I open my mouth, rotate. So it enables the technology to really just understand me a bit better, track my emotions a little bit, understand my body language and, and my movements. So what kind of apps do you see? What, what, is there a kind of, has, has any developers used it or do you know? Yeah, we've, we've actually had 35,000 downloads of the SDK so far. So there's plenty of developers that are using it. And we're seeing a very broad range of uh, usages. There's some games, which is interesting. Uh, we're seeing some stuff with uh, removing the background. Um, so if I'm in the foreground of a video shot, then all of the background around me can be removed completely. And so that's, that's interesting for privacy. It's also interesting for saving space on the screen. Um, we've seen some interesting stuff around 3D scanning, which we saw earlier. Um, we've also seen some interesting stuff around how to navigate an interface in a, in a hands-free way. If you don't want to touch the screen and leave fingerprints, or if you've got something on your hand, then that's a pretty convenient way of also navigating through, through different windows in faster ways yes. than using shortcuts. So with the gesture instead exactly. of having to touch yeah. it. What's also very interesting is augmented reality and being able to interact with augmented reality. And that's where the hand tracking comes in very useful, uh, especially because you might have an overlay on the video feed of, of graphics and what you can then do is start moving things and, and that's interesting for school type examples or books where you can really make the, the characters and the, the things within the book come alive and you can interact with them, play with them, you know, they can walk around with you and you know, it just becomes a lot more immersive. So this is good for teaching kids and just bringing things more alive. It looks exciting, right? What future tech would you love to see? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and keep a log to tehu.com for the latest tech news, reviews and features.